if you weren't here last week, we should tell you that something special happened. About five minutes before we were ready to start service, all the electricity went out. Not just here, but in the whole quadrant, because somebody had hit a transformer or something like that. And so, um, and it was kind of awkward, wasn't it? But I really liked it because all y'all moved a little closer and I thought, now that was really nice and it felt like you were leaning in a little more. (laughs) But to those of you who watch us online, I'm sorry we weren't able to post our message last week. Um, But anyway, it's just good to have our electricity back. But also to know that even if we didn't, we'd still be here worshiping God and learning from his word. Isn't that a good thing? Yeah. So we've been watching or reading through Um, Proverbs and looking at the wisdom of Solomon and and actually taking a deeper look at a few particular topics that appear throughout the book of Proverbs. And I want to remind you that Proverbs are not necessarily promises. They're more principles or truths that help us to live our lives more successfully. And so last week we talked about the company you keep And I hope um, that your takeaway from that message, if you were here, was that while we are always called to be in the world and to interact with the world around us, our goal should be to connect with those who are wise, who will strengthen your Christian faith, and who will stick with you like a brother going to the Lord on your behalf. And that's how God means for us to go through life with people like that surrounding us The company you keep makes a very big difference in the life you live. Those are the people that help determine your reputation, your values, and oftentimes your relationship with God and what that looks like. Well, today we're going to look at another aspect of life that also makes a very big difference for us, and that is the work that you do. I know you're like, oh, we have to talk about work? <laughs> I love work, all right? But there's a debate that goes on about work, whether we should, have you heard this, live to work or work to live, right? And I want to tell you that neither one of those is correct. As Christians, we don't live to work. We live to glorify God. But we also don't just work to live. Work is a necessary part of life. If I want to eat, then somebody's going to have to work to provide that, right? But work has a greater purpose in our life than just income that sustains us. Because it has a lot to do with who we are and how we glorify God. Last year, the Pew Research Center released a statistic that said that over 70% of Americans say that their job either somewhat or is either somewhat or extremely central to their overall identity. The work that we do tends to define, at least in part, who we think we are. And that makes sense, doesn't it? When somebody comes to you and they say, well, what do you do? There's a lot of ways that you could respond to that, but we tend to respond with our occupation. You see, you could say, I scroll on Instagram most of the day. Or you could say, I like to play with my dog, or I go fishing at the lake. And now those are things that you do Most of us still tend to respond with our occupation instead, with the thing that we think feels the most significant. I'm a pastor, I'm a plumber, I work in food service, I was a truck driver. You see, there are all these things that are defining us based on what we do. And before I go any further, I just want to stop and clarify something, because We tend to think of work in a very specific, structured way, as this is the place I go to earn a paycheck, and maybe that's to go to an office or to sit in front of a computer all day or to be out in a truck all day. But um, if you're thinking about tuning out because you're retired or a stay-at-home mom or because you're a student or you're disabled, I want you to stay tuned in to this subject because... Even if you don't have a traditional job that earns a paycheck, work should still be an important part of your life, some kind of work. And that's why we're going to look a little deeper today to see what God says about it, okay? So first of all, we know that God works. Did you know that God worked? That was right there in the very beginning. If you read it in Genesis, right? Did you read that? He worked to create our world. And so in Genesis 2, 2, it says, On the seventh day, God finished his work 
of creation, and so he rested from all his work. God worked. Now, I don't know about you, but I tend to think of it as he like spoke and it happened. But the, the scriptures say he actually worked to bring it about, right? But he also declared then that humans should work. Do you remember when that happened? Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and they had everything they needed. But they turned away from God with their decision to sin. And part of the consequence of that was that they would have to work to provide for themselves. In Genesis 3:19, God told Adam, "By the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made." That's work, isn't it? The sweat of your brow. And I'm so thankful that we have food in grocery stores and farmers markets. All that food is there by the sweat of somebody's brow, isn't it? But even if we don't work to make our own food, we generally have to work in order to enjoy the fruits of their work. Does that make sense? So you may not be working for your food, but you are working for your food. You see, work has been around since the very beginning. That's just how it works. It's a part of God's plan for us. So no matter what your work is, whether it's paid or unpaid, whether it's full-time or part-time or all the time, it's an opportunity for you to fulfill God's purpose for your life and to bring him glory at the same time. Do you remember what Ephesians 2.10 says? For we are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. See, God means for us to do good works. And then Paul told the Thessalonians that those among them who were unwilling to work shouldn't eat. I think that's a good principle. If a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat, right? And after that, he says, we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's businesses because honestly, when you don't work, that kind of thing just kind of happens, right? What else do I got to think about? Well, maybe I need to be in everybody else's business. And that's what was going on in Thessaloniki, right? And so he's calling them out on this, and he says, We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. And as for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. So we need to get to work, don't we? God has good work for you to do. But how we approach our work makes all the difference in the world. You'll notice that Solomon's advice has little to do with the kind of work you do. Instead, his Proverbs have more to do with how you approach that work. So let's look at some of his examples. First, we will see that Solomon says we should work hard. Hard work is good for you. It challenges us, whether it's a physical or a mental challenge. It gives us a sense of accomplishment, and it also provides for us. So hard work makes us feel good about us and what we can accomplish. It provides for us. It also helps us to find favor with others. Have you ever looked at somebody and said, oh, she's a hard worker? Yeah, that's a compliment, isn't it? So then he talks about this in Proverbs chapter 6. If you want to read with me, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Proverbs 6, let's look at verses 6 through 11. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. But you lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little more folding of the hands to rest. I would add today a little more scrolling on your iPhone. Right? <laughs> then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit and scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. What an interesting analogy that is that Solomon would use this as he's talking to his son, a prince who probably felt like he didn't have to work at all. And yet here Solomon is saying that it is wise 
to work hard, especially in order to prepare for your future needs. And he says the ants don't work hard because somebody's making them. They work hard because it is the wise way to take care of themselves. God put that in them. I don't think the ants are sitting in the anthill going, should we go to work today? I don't know. I'm not really feeling it. No, God just put it in them. They just do it. They go and they do and they work to save up for what they're going to need later. Back before I was in ministry, I worked with some people who didn't really like to work. Have you ever been in that environment? Yeah? And these are the people that would show up most days, but they would not get a lot done, or they would get just enough done to get by, right? I did what I had to do. And if the work day ended at 5 o'clock, they were in their cars down the road at 5.01, right? These people can be really frustrating if you really like to work, especially if they get the same pay as you do. And so I worked in human resources, and we used to have this thing we called the I.O. ratio, which I.O. is input over outcome. So if I feel like I'm putting a lot in and I'm getting a certain amount and somebody else is over here and they're not working very hard, but they're getting the same outcome, then I need to make that fair. And so either they need to get more out or put more into it, or I need to put less into it. And so working around people who don't work hard can be very demotivating. It can make you feel like you need to reduce what you're doing, well, they're not working hard and they're fine, so maybe I just need to not work as hard. And that's so easy for that to happen. But the truth of the matter is, your hard work pays off in the long term. It's like working in the summer to store up for winter. Because when it comes time for layoffs or streamlining the organization, who do you think is going to be let go? The people who don't show up or the people who don't work hard when they're there. When it comes time for someone to get a promotion, who do you think has the best chance? The person who shows up ready to work hard. You see, Solomon's wisdom knew that. That's why in Proverbs 10 verses 4 and 5 it says, Lazy people are soon poor, hard workers get rich. A wise youth harvests in the summer, but one who sleeps during harvest is a disgrace. And this principle is even more true if you work for yourself, if you're um, owning your own business, or if you're working like a farmer, as many of those in Solomon's kingdom did. When your well-being depends on what you produce, then you work hard to make sure that you have all that you need. And you work wisely to make sure that you're prepared for seasons ahead. So you see, it honors God when, it, when we work hard. And it takes care of us when we work hard. Proverbs 12, 11 says, A hard worker has plenty of food, but a person who chases fantasies has no sense. And I love that verse. And it's also repeated in Proverbs 28, 19. And I think this is really the same as the law of reaping what you sow. So you can, if you work hard, you're going to get what you need. But chasing fantasies looks like um, running off to do whatever you want to do instead of work because that doesn't sound like fun. kind of reminds me of the story of the prodigal son. You remember that? The son took his inheritance and went off to party with it. And he squandered it all away. And he ended up feeling jealous of the pigs that he was feeding because all his money was gone. He had chased fantasies. And meanwhile, his older brother stayed home and worked hard. And that older brother, while jealous when his brother first came back, he was told, but everything we have belongs to you. And so the inheritance was his. You see, it is wise to work hard. Another thing we should do in our work is to work with integrity. There's a lot of ways that you can define integrity. I like that it means doing the right thing every time, even when no one is looking. Now, can I just mention that if you slack off while you're getting paid to do a job, that is the same as stealing from an employer. It lacks integrity. When they're paying you to do a job and you're checking your Facebook, you're stealing from them. Proverbs 28:17 says that workers who protect their employer's interests will prosper. 
That's an important principle, isn't it? When you do a job, don't just look at what's in it for you. Look at it as what can you do for your employer. And that reminds me of another parable, right, that Jesus told in Matthew 25. And it tells the story of a master who had three servants. And he went away on a trip. And so before he left, he gave his three servants money to watch over. Do you remember this story? To one servant, he gave five bags of silver. To one, he gave three bags of silver. And to the last, he gave one bag of silver. And it says that he gave it out based on their abilities. He knew what they could handle, right? And then the the owner goes away, and when he comes back, he finds that the first two servants had worked to invest their money, what was given and trusted to them, and they had doubled it for him. But the third servant had buried his money so that it didn't even earn interest. The first two servants were praised and given even more responsibilities, but the third servant was called wicked, and he was thrown out. You see the principle? Watch out for your employer's interest. Use the gifts that you're given for the greater good. Work with integrity. Integrity means that we should protect our employer's interest, but it also means that we should do the right thing when we are at work, that we should show up when we're expected, that we should be fair and honest in our work. In the workplace, your reputation should be one of trustworthiness, shouldn't it? Your boss, your coworkers, your customers and clients, they should be able to depend on you and to trust that whatever you say is true and that you will do what you say you will do. These are important aspects of your life at work that show people who you are. Proverbs 11.1 1 says, The Lord detests the use of dishonest scales, but he delights in accurate weights. That means he likes fairness when we're dealing with other people. And Proverbs 28.8 says income from charging high interest rates will end up in the pocket of someone who is kind to the poor. Some translations call that usury and extortion. And what that means is that we shouldn't take from others by charging more than what we need to. It doesn't mean you can't get a fair return. It means that you shouldn't try to get an excessive return at someone else's expense. God wants us to work with integrity. He wants us to do the right thing, no matter what kind of work we do or where that work takes place. And all of that is because God wants us to work as though working for him and not for man. Have you heard that? Working for the Lord doesn't mean that you have to have a job in ministry, although it certainly does apply to you if you have a job in the church, which 95% of y'all have a job in the church, right? And so when you do it, you don't do it for me and you don't do it for generations, you do it for the Lord, right? That's why you're here. But it means even when you're in a secular job that your true boss is really the Lord. Does that make sense? Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. That's in the NLT, but other translations say, commit your works to the Lord and you will succeed. And that goes right along with Colossians 3.23, which says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. That sounds really easy. Do you remember who that was addressed to? Work willingly at whatever you do as though you are working for the Lord rather than people. He was addressing slaves who very right, may have very rightfully been able to turn around and be grumbling and not wanting to give it more than they had to and feel like they were entrapped and all of that. And to them, Paul writes, work at what you do as though you're working for the Lord. And after that, he says, the Lord will give you an inheritance as a reward. So when you decide that he is your boss, you get the benefits he provides, right? When you work for him, you will receive his blessings. We need to give God our very best. Most of you won't have a job in ministry, at least not an official one. 
But here's what I want you to know, that every job you work can become a ministry. You have a chance to represent the Father when you are in the workplace. And the witness that you have there may be far more important than the actual work you do. You don't have to preach to people to do that, right? You just need to love them and let them see Jesus in you as you do your work with diligence and integrity. That means that you are kind and unselfish, that you are compassionate, that you can speak the truth with love, that you don't rely on profanity to make a point, that you refuse to take the Lord's name in vain or participate in anything that would discredit him. It means also that you remain calm in a crisis. Why should Christian workers be calm in a crisis? Because you know God's got you right? And even if it seems a little crazy, you know who's in charge. So while the rest of the world is going around in chaos, we can be calm because our Father is on the job too. You represent Christ when you go into the workplace. And what you have to know is that people will learn what he is like by watching you. And you may be the only Jesus they get to see that day. This is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. He says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You see? People are watching. And what they see in you will help determine what they think about Jesus. That's a, that applies whether you're in a factory or a farm or at home or in retail. What is the result of working for the Lord? We're more likely to be successful. We will receive an inheritance as a reward and other people will praise God because of us. That sounds pretty important to me, doesn't it, to you? So what about the time outside of your job or those of you who don't have traditional jobs? It means that every day you should be looking for what the work is that God has for you that day. What is your assignment right where you are? What is the good work he has in store for you today? If you are still on this planet and breathing oxygen, God has a purpose for your life. He has a job for you to do. Good work created in advance for you. We don't get to retire from serving the Lord. When we see those opportunities, we need to walk through the doors in order to serve him. And you know, it might mean that we have to put down our phones or turn off the Netflix or whatever it is that distracts you. It might mean that we have to leave our house in order to encounter other people so that we can be a positive force in their life. It may mean that we need to look at the people who live in our house as objects of ministry as well, or targets of ministry, I should say. How am I showing Jesus to the people in my house today? No matter what your skills are, no matter what your age is, God has a work for you to do. My mother-in-law, Anne, is a great example of this, and y'all know this, right? When she moved in with us a couple of years ago, she said, I need to find a job. And so we went to the Wilson County Help Center, and she went up to the lady in charge, and she said, I need a job. And the lady looked at her and said, "Um, we don't have any openings right now. (laughs) And so we clarified, no, she's looking to volunteer. And then she lit up, oh, you want to volunteer. All right, so she didn't see it as a job, but it was, right? So after that, then Anne began volunteering at the help center, which she does every week, several times a week. 
Sometimes when she doesn't feel like it, she still gets up and goes, right? Anne's been faithful in her work at the help center. She keeps their books in order at the thrift store, but she does a whole lot more than that. She talks to customers and she encourages workers. She invites people to church. She took them donuts on her birthday, which she also brought to us, right? Like we all got fatter on her birthday. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> she carefully selects books for the people that she knows and cares about. I think so-and-so would like this. Or I think some, this person is interested in this. And she spends way more money probably than she should mailing those books to people all over the country, as well as bringing some of them to you. You see, she's turned a volunteer opportunity into a ministry. And people see the love of Jesus in her. That's what it looks like to work for the Lord, even at 83. You may not be able to do those kinds of things, right? You may have to be creative for how you work for the Lord. But can I just tell you, I think everybody can do something. It might mean that you write notes of encouragement to people. Do you know some people never hear a positive word about themselves? And to get a note or a text or an email from somebody saying, I just wanted you to know that you did an awesome job at this or that you looked beautiful today or that I love being your friend or whatever it is, that can minister to somebody. It also might mean bringing people you know into the Lord's presence through intercessory prayer. I've read stories of women who were bedridden that others would bring prayer requests to by the dozens and who would lay in their beds all day and pray over those lists, bringing people to the Lord. Prayer has power. When you pray for somebody else, you're working for the Lord, right? I don't know what it looks like for every one of us, but I've seen it happen here in those kinds of ways. Discipling people over the phone, being a light to the people around you. It's different for every one of us, but God has a work for you to do that he prepared just for you. And he's really not interested in what your excuses are. He knows what you're capable of doing, doesn't he? He won't ask you to do something you're not able to do. But he's looking for hearts that want to serve him. We are wise. We work hard. We work with integrity. And we work for the Lord. That work shouldn't be your identity. Because he is your identity. And so your work says a lot about who he is. Does that make sense? This morning our altars are open. And if you're having a hard time being a light at work, then this might be a good time for you to pray about it. Or maybe you've been lazy and not giving your efforts to God. Or maybe you have some excuses that you thought meant you didn't have to serve. Maybe you need to talk to God and ask for his forgiveness in that. Or maybe you just need to ask him to help you to see the opportunities that lie before you. God, I don't want to miss a door that you opened for me to witness for you. God, I don't want to miss a heart that's hurting that needs a hug or a smile. God, I don't want to miss an opportunity to take care of a need that other people have walked right by. I saw a video this week. Did you see the video of John Bon Jovi on the bridge in Nashville? There was a woman on the other side of the bridge about to jump, right? And so Bon Jovi came over and talked to the lady, and next thing you know, she's coming back over and giving him a hug, right? And that's a pretty thing, pretty amazing thing, and it got lots of, lots of repetition because he's famous, right? But what struck me most about that video was that there was a family who walked by before that who just looked at the lady on the bridge. Like, that's really weird. And then they kept walking. 
And I've just been thinking about that since then and thinking, Lord, how many times have I just walked by somebody without stopping to think, this could be a good work you've planned for me to do. Maybe you put me here for this reason. It shouldn't have to be a celebrity. And it shouldn't have to be something that's shared on the news, right? But every day we walk by people who are hurting, who need us to stop and go, you know what? Jesus loves you. How can I help you? What work can I do for you that goes beyond saying, well, I hope your day gets better or I'll say a prayer for you. God, I want to work hard. I want to work with integrity, but most of all, I want to work with your heart that shows me the people who need help and that calls me to come alongside them because that's what Jesus does. And so if you're like me and you're looking for those opportunities, maybe you want to bring that to an altar. Say, God, open my eyes. I promise you if you ask him, he will. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for all of those who worked hard for you before us so that we might have the privilege of being your children. I pray, Lord, that you would give us hearts that are open to whatever work you have us to do. I pray that we would see the opportunities around us, not that we would be lazy and consumed with entertaining ourselves or or thinking that we've already done our share and it's our time to rest. And Lord, we know that we need days to rest, but your job's not done. So I pray that you would inspire us, open our eyes to show us the work you have for us. Give us that spark, that Holy Spirit power to do everything we do well with so much excellence that it can't help but represent you. And Lord, we give the results to you. We'll do our part and we'll trust it to you. And we'll welcome your inheritance as you see fit. Thank you, Lord. Bless our work, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.